that dwells within us. That dwells within us. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from Luke chapter 3, page 60. We begin with verse 15. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. So if you wanted to open your hymn books to page 484, I'm going to take us through the words of this hymn. I went to church one time and the preacher was tended to preach for about 45 minutes and he got up and said well I've got eight things to say this morning and he started going and I started counting and I was up to seven and waiting on him to wind it up when he said now thirdly <laughs> so I don't want you to to despair as you read the words of this hymn and think, oh, are we ever going to get to the end? We, we will. And the hymn will grow on you. So it starts off, out of deep, unordered water, God created light and land. And this refers to the waters of chaos. The ancients believed that before there was anything else, there was just water in every direction. And creation was mostly the act of making a bubble in that water and making a dry place where the earth could be. To these desert wandering Hebrews, the water, the ocean, was frightening and terrible. It reminded them of the wild, unordered, chaotic forces in the world and they didn't like it. It reminded them of the forces that the nations, the, the other gods of other nations tried to use to their advantage. Forces of which the Hebrews said, our God created them. You see, deep water doesn't scare God. It's a word, world of bird and beast, and later in God's image, woman, man. So God created the dry land in the daylight. God created the world and all that's in it. He made all the plants. He made all the creatures. He made the things that fly in the air and the things that creep and crawl on the ground and even the ones that swim in the seas. God made all the creatures. And every day at the end of the day, he'd clap his hands and shout, good, it's good. And how long did it take? No one knows, and it doesn't matter. The important thing is God did it. How God did it can be endlessly debated. But faith says, however he did it, God did it and created the heavens and the earth. And then finally, woman and man. Now the traditional way of reading these stories takes this as a hierarchical thing with the man on the top. Let's read again. In Genesis 1, it says that God created Adam in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. Adam is a word that means roughly earthling. 
It means humanity. Someone said, God created the humans from the humus. He created us from the dirt. And he made us male and he made us female. And that's all Genesis 1 will say. In Genesis 2, you get this whole story of uh, God created the man and then all the animals to be his partner and nothing would suit. So then he created the woman. And you could read that to say that the woman is the crowning glory, the final perfection in God's creation. You could read it that way. Think about that. And the woman is created to work in partnership with the man in tending the garden. So creation itself starts in water. The spirit broods over the face of the water. The spirit moves, God speaks, the word creates, and there's light, and there's land, and there's life. There is water in the river bringing life to tree and plant. So Genesis describes this mythical garden where the tree of life stands and the rivers run. Revelation describes the same river and the same tree in the city of God when all is restored. The river of the water of life, the living water, Jesus Christ, gives all of us life eternal. That's verse 1. So verse 2 says, water on the human forehead, birthmark of the love of God. And so we baptize. We put some water on the forehead. Some people put three drops. I try to go for three handfuls and splash it all over the place. We'll see what happens. There are whole libraries full of books arguing how old you should be, how aware you should be, how you should be baptized, and if you should be dunked or not, and all of that stuff. There is the testimony of Hippolytus in the second century, about a hundred years after Jesus or so. And his testimony as to the way it's always been done was that it was bap baptism happened at dawn on Easter in the river with the candidates naked. Children going in the water first, followed by the men and then the women. That's how we should baptize people. <laughs> Or not. <laughs> the best advice also from the first century of the church says baptize in cold running water. If you can't find cold water then use lukewarm. And if no run running water can be found then use a pool. And if there isn't enough to dip somebody in it then sprinkle it on their heads. The amount of water and the way we do it can be adapted to local custom and circumstance and doesn't matter. It's that we do it that's important. And the water is the birthmark of the love of God. That's a lovely image. We're marked by God's love, sealed with his spirit. Most Protestants have forgotten the ancient custom of also anointing the person baptized with oil as, as a, a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in the ancient church, you were baptized, anointed with oil, and then taken immediately to the table and fed the bread and wine. When we baptize, we also remember the Trinity. God exists as Trinity, and God is love. And so the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and they both love the Spirit. God's very life is this love. And so baptism is a sign of God's love for us. We are baptized into Christ, so we are baptized into this loving life of God. And just as a watermark on a piece of paper indicates that it's genuine, so the watermark on our lives indicates that we are God's own. And God loves us. Is the sign of death and rising through the sea there runs a road. Now here the hymn takes on 
two major symbols of salvation. One is from Romans 6, where Paul compares being lowered into the water of baptism, when you're dunked under, to being buried. Bapti baptism by immersion for Paul is a symbol of, of being buried with Christ. And if you read those verses, you will see that we're united with Christ in his death, and so we are united with him in his resurrection. And we come out of the water as he came out of the grave. And so baptism acts out our salvation. The other symbol is the rescue of the Hebrews from the Egyptian army at the Red Sea back in, in Exodus. The waters parted and the Hebrews went across dry land. And then the waters engulfed the pursuing chariots of Egypt. And horse and rider were thrown into the sea, it says, and the people saved by God's mighty arm. You can read about that in Exodus 15. God saves his people. So the water of baptism is the water of salvation. Standing round the font reminds us of the Hebrews' climb ashore. Life is hallowed by the knowledge God has been this way before. God has been this way before. God was with the Hebrews in the water, seeing to it that they could pass through it without being swept away, and God delivered them in the water. God has been through the water of baptism, in the baptism by John that we read about, the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, being buried and rising again. And we stand at the font, remembering the stories that tell us how God acts to save us, and we know that we are on a road that God himself has trod. That God has been this way before indicates the true miracle and mystery of our faith, the one that we celebrated just weeks ago at Christmas, that God became one of us. God became a man and shared in the person of Jesus all the pain and the trouble and all the joys and the sweetness and all the temptations and the hungers of what it means to be one of us. So whatever you face and whatever road you're on, Take heart. God has been that way before. And then the chorus, and it ends, let creation praise its giver, there is water in the font. So as we celebrate the baptism of people from time to time, we remember all these different meanings, and baptism has layers of meaning. We recall all of that as we stand together at the font. For there is water in the font. The water is the living water, Jesus Christ, who said that he came to give us life, who promised that whoever drinks of this water will never thirst, and who washes us clean and sustains us day by day. The font is the fountain. John Calvin frequently called God the fountain of all good. God is the source and the fountain, the font from which all blessings flow. And all the good gifts of God's grace flow from his hand as a stream pours forth from a spring. The water in the font then is the living water of Christ and here it is poured out for all of us. So remember and give thanks, for you are baptized. Amen.